whirlpool, a hydrodynamic vortex, essentially a tornado in water. The whirlpool, with its characteristic funnel shape and its ability to suck objects into it like a tornado or a black hole, is one of the most fascinating and enigmatic phenomena in nature. But is the whirlpool much more than just a visual curiosity? Could its definitive circular motion be harnessed for propulsion and even levity? And what does the behavior and properties of the whirlpool tell us about the nature of flowing water and even other fluids such as air? One man who attempted to derive answers to these questions was Victor Schauberger. Like Nikola Tesla and John Worrell Keeley, Victor Schauberger was one of those rare individuals who gained a vast insight into the inner workings of nature over his lifetime. Whereas Tesla's medium of operation was high frequency alternating current and Keeley high frequency sound waves, Schauberger's principal medium was water. His understanding of the movement of water arose from long observations of flowing water in rivers and streams in his native Austria. His core conclusions were that the energy generated by means of heat, explosion, and centrifugal movement tend to be more often than not destructive and harmful to the environment, while implosion and centripetal motion means an increased concentration of energy, cooling, and levity. Typical examples of such energy in the natural environment are, of course, whirlpools and the whirlwind. Like the ancients before him, Schauberger's motto was to comprehend and copy nature, devising methods to mimic and work with natural forces rather than methods to tame and overpower them. However, I must add here that the term centrifugal itself is often treated as pejorative by many who refer to Schauberger's theories. But centrifugal motion itself is actually only the flip side of the coin of centripetal and is a vital and necessary part of the process of renewal and regeneration. I will demonstrate this duality of centrifugal and centripetal and how they complement each other later in the video. But Schauberger was amazed at how trout could not only remain motionless in rushing water but can also swim against the current and even propel itself in the opposite direction of the stream and even propel itself up a waterfall. These amazing feats are partly due to sucker features on the abdomen and their mouths. And they can jump waterfalls partially by a rapid and powerful undulation of their tails. But Schauberger stated that another important principle that made this possible was the vortex. He explained that vortices form behind objects in the path of flowing water, particularly objects such as oval shaped rocks and stones. This phenomenon is known today as the Carmen Bernard vortex sheet, in which tiny vortices from alternating form alternately from one side to the next, as shown in the figure here. The trout meander between these vortices, synchronizing with their flows. Theoretically, this allows them to do two things. One, they can remain motionless in a neutral zone of pressure between oncoming vortices. And second, they can position their bodies and expose their scales in such a way that the vortices actually push them upstream. As we see in the diagram, these tiny vortices circulate in the direction of upstream from the vantage point between the vortices. A trout's scales are smooth and frictionless in one direction from the head to the tail, but are rough in the reverse direction from tail fin to head. As seen in the next figure, the trout can move its body so as to expose the rough side of its scales to the incoming vortex, vortex up draft or upflow, which then helps to propel it itself upstream. It is truly a miracle of creation. We can see in the experiment here that the popsicle stick 
is propelled from one side in between the two vortices to the opposite side. Even though there is no gradient in this particular experiment, if direction of the opposite side was going in the direction of upstream, then the stick would be propelled against the stream's gradient. The vortex on the left is spinning in the clockwise direction, while the right vortex is spinning in the counterclockwise direction. Hence from the position in between the two vortices, the direction of propulsion is in the direction shown. Of course, it's not entirely necessary to have multiple vortices to do this. Even one vortex could provide upflow as shown here. The trout would just have to shift this body in the right way to ensure that it is propelled in the direction it wants to travel and does not get sucked back into the vortex. It's like knowing when to jump off of a spinning merry-go-round. It is also very similar to the gravity assist technique in which the spacecraft can use the gravity of a nearby planetary body to provide an energetic boost in the needed direction while conserving fuel. The ancients, also being astute observers, apparently understood the pro properties of vortices as shown in the following ancient pictograph on one of the ancient megalithic temples in Malta that's just south of Sicily. It appears to be four vortices flowing in opposite directions surrounding a central figure in a calm center. I attempted to duplicate the proposed principles experimentally with four vortex generators. By spinning the motors and hence the vortices in the directions implied in the pictograph, we can see that the stick is momentarily stationary in the central region. It is here that a trout might exert minimal energy to stabilize itself and remain relatively motionless within this semi-calm region. Other pictographs here seem to show figures meandering between vortices. Interestingly, the experiment demonstrates a similar motion here with a round top meandering between the two mini whirlpools. These same propulsion principles also apply to air since it, since it is a fluid. For example, if the parachute of a base jumper is deployed into an updraft of air, the jumper will of course be carried up along with it. Birds can utilize some of these same principles during hovering and flight in order to conserve energy. These processes mirror one of Schauberger's poetic sentiments that the fish does not swim, it is swum, and the bird does not fly, it is flown. But these vortices also manifest their properties in other ways. One particular account of Schauberger's observations romanticizes one of his late night strolls along a rushing stream on a cold, moonlit winter night. As he stood on the bank, looking into the deep, clear water, he could see several egg-shaped stones about the size of a human head that were jostling about at the bottom. The stones then started a circle in the same way that trout do just before jumping up a waterfall. Suddenly one of the rocks rose up through the water until it broke the surface with a halo of ice forming around its edges. Hydrodynamic levitation via the power of the vortex. From these and many other observations, Schauberger surmised that the normal movements of natural forces follow a spiraling vortexual pattern which is reflected in the physical patterns of snail shells, whirlpools, galaxies, seashells, and countless other formations as if reflecting some universal background motion underpinning all of reality. This rising egg-shaped stone observed by Schauberger brings to mind my attempts to, to duplicate John World Keeley's weights and jars experiments using sonic vibrations to levitate an egg in a water-filled jar. Similar to Schauberger, Keeley also described rotating vortices as a universal motion underlying the fabric of reality. 
these universal vortices were also also mentioned in the work of Nikolai A. Kozirov, who referred to them as torsion waves. In Keeley's own words, all such experiments that I've made with sympathetic vibrations result in vortex motion invariably. Vortex motion follows nature in all corpuscular action. Notably, according to his research, this vortex motion correlates with certain musical notes. He claims that the notes B flat, D natural, and F and their combinations produce vortexual spin in one direction, while the notes D, F sharp, and A have a tendency to spin in the opposite direction. Even mainstream science has proven that alternating vortices, such as those in the aforementioned vortex sheet, can generate sonic vibrations and even resonance under the right conditions within the objects that they encounter in the air or the water. In my, <clears throat> in my egg and jar experiment, the sonic vibrations create vortices in the water, creating a region of low pressure between the vibrator and the egg, which results in the latter's levitation. So what this means is that the sonic vibrations create vortices and vice versa. They are intrinsically connected and both can generate levitation and lift. Mainstream science also acknowledges the ability of these vortices to generate lift and thrust and the principle of leading edge vortices. Winged insects and winged vehicles both make use of these vortices to enhance lift and conserve energy during flight. Looking into the vortex itself, its primary characteristic is its inward centripetal motion, as is readily seen in whirlpools. This type of energy is associated with a cooling and densifying effect on the water and the air, hence significantly increasing its carrying power. A true champion of nature, it was only a matter of time before Schauberger began to apply these principles of levity and cooling to industry. During his stint as a forester after World War I, the logging industry was experiencing great financial difficulty due to the high cost of transporting large amounts of wood from deep forests. Schauberger's in insight into centripetal motion inspired him to construct log flumes with veins. These veins were a vital feature which would make the water in the flumes to flow in a twisting motion just as it does in rivers and streams. This enabled the flumes to carry significantly heavier loads with less water, resulting in a nearly 92% reduction in operation costs. This would be equivalent to reducing friction with a technique like acoustic lubrication. It was not long before Schauberger's expertise caught the attention of the Nazis who wanted him to assist in the development of advanced vertical takeoff aircraft, which they believed would help them to win the war. His prototype called the Repulsing reportedly worked by using a self-generated vortex to create a, a vacuum just above the craft. Now we can note that this is in opposition to the hovercraft, which traps and pressurizes the air beneath it in order to achieve lift. So rather than being pushed from the ground, as well as in the direction of travel, the repulsing would instead be sucked into regions of low pressure just above the craft, as well as in the direction of travel. Now, in addition to implosion, Schauberger also submitted that an additional force is known to contribute to the craft's levitation. This force arose from Diamag diamagnetic field, which he claimed was caused by electric uh, charge separation in the fluid via air or water. He called this force biomagnetism. Early tests with it described it as a type of glowing magnetism. According to the document here, this diamagnetism as a property of fresh water flows all over the Earth's surface and radiates any surplus energy vertically 
and can thus carry along anything caught in its weight, such as trout in a river. Diamagnetism is found in all materials. However, because it is so weak, it can usually only be observed in materials do, that do not exhibit other forms of magnetism, like paramagnetism and ferromagnetism. Common diamagnetic materials include bismuth, pyrolytic, carbon, copper, air, and water. The article goes on to say that adding diamagnetic catalysts to a fluid or creating the structural parts of a device from diamagnetic materials as opposed to paramagnetic or ferromagnetic materials will produce an upward flowing diamagnetism, a formative and levitative force that soars upwards, sucking the generation device up in its weight. This force is apparently dependent on the rate of rotation of the fluid. But is this the same type of diamagnetism as defined by modern science? Mainstream science defines diamagnetism as a quantum effect in which an external magnetic field induces a secondary magnetic field which repels the former. Diamagnetic materials expel this external field because its dipoles line up in opposition to it. But Schauberger's diamagnetism is not just a barely perceptible static force which repels magnetism, but it is instead a powerful dynamic entity which undulates, meanders, and even floats upwards in defiance of gravity, almost as if it were a living thing in itself. And as such, biomagnetism seems all the more fitting a name as it encompasses not only diamagnetism as we know it, but also en encompasses electric charge and bioelectricity. But what do these bioenergetic forces react against in order to produce levity? The strongest diamagnets, of course, are superconductors. However, superconductors as well as natural diamagnets, like air and water, or bismuth, need an external field to react against and, and expel to produce levity. Do these earth, do the earth's magnetic and electric fields serve in this capacity? We know that the intensity of the geomagnetic field is relatively weak but still has enormous energy due to its vast size and reach. Could we theorize that the diamagnetic properties of water would generate a considerable force of levity when flowing over large enough areas? Is this Schauberger's outward flowing di diamagnetism? Could it even be why over Earth, old Earth science often associates ley lines which concentrates the Earth's magnetic field lines with surface and underground waterways, both natural and artificial. We can see here how this small container of water is weakly repelled by a strong magnet. And in the next demonstration, we see a high voltage charge exerting an attractive force on a stream of water. Now we are already familiar with this, but what we can see is that the small sand particles that I'm dropping in it become dissolved and are also pulled along with the water. Now if we can extrapolate this small stream of water to a large stream or river, then we can imagine how the Earth's energetic fields might be able to provide levity to, a, to the water as well as any materials within it, such as rocks, stones, animals, and trout. So in addition to the gravitational influences of the moon, and the planetary bodies, we can see that electricity and magnetism might also exert a significant influence on the movement and behavior of water, as well as anything contained therein. The water is a conduit. We understand these forces as magnetohydrodynamics and electrohydrodynamics. And if these forces are in fact dependent on the flow and rotational rates of the fluids, then we might expect that the forces of levity to be even stronger within rotating vortices. This relationship essentially describes the principle of the magnetohydrodynamic power generator, a device which generates electric power by means of the interaction between a moving fluid and a magnetic field. 
Low magnetohydrodynamic power generation typically uses plasma or ionized gas as the moving fluid. The same principle would apply to an aqueous solution, particularly salt water. From this we can deduce that a fluid of varying conductivities, such as earth water, traveling through the geomagnetic field, would likewise experience an electromotive force. The magnitude which would be dependent not only on the local strength of the geomagnetic field, but also the angle to which the water flows through that field, the conductivity of water, and the speed of the water flow. Hence we can also deduce that fast moving water flow in vortices might also experience a force due to the Earth's magnetic field in proportion to their rotational speeds. The faster the flow speed, the greater the electromotive force which will be, which will be imparted to the water. This force could manifest as turbulence or perhaps even enhance levity on the water in anything it contains. If so, then magnetohydrodynamics should have some effect on the propulsion of trout and other fish upstream and even up waterfalls. Perhaps this was at least part of the magnetic force of levity which Schauberger was referring to. Some other streams of thought, such as that mentioned in the document here, theorize that depending on the speed and intensity of the vortex's physical motion, that it can act directly on the molecules of water itself, separating the electrons from the hydrogen nuclei and creating hydrogen ions as well as hydrogen gas. The article specifically refers to the production of protons or positively charged hydrogen ions, even though negatively charged ions would be liberated as well. Thus it appears that implosions can fragment molecules just as explosions can. Now all this would mean that even fresh water could be ionized and be subjected to the same magnetohydrodynamics as seawater in addition to the aforementioned diamagnetohydrodynamics. But how were these properties and principles harnessed by Schauberger to design his unique repulsing craft? If the craft were using diamagnetism then what external field was it pushing against? Was it pushing against the Earth's magnetic field as theorized above with the natural flowing water? Was it a process similar to that proposed by Nikola Tesla's alleged electromagnetic field lift? Or does it somehow interact directly with gravity? Does the craft generate its own magnetic field? which diamatic, diamagnetically acts on the airflow that it intakes? Actually, a number of, question, of these questions may be answered in the following document, simply entitled Schauberger Technology. It explains that Schauberger's repulsing may have relied on a multi-phase propulsion system, which harnessed several different forces, which include the following. An extremely low pressure, just above the craft into which the entire craft was sucked. Magnetic propulsion resulting from the interaction between the intense magnetic fields generated within the craft and the external, uh, external geomagnetic field. And gravitational propulsion due to the high speed mass rotation of the vehicle's inner chamber which interacted with the terrestrial gravity via the gyroscopic effect. Even though these are different propulsive effects, they are all connected and primarily generated by the extremely fast centrifugal and centripetal motion of the air. This powerful vortex dissociates the molecules of air into electrically charged particles or ions. This extreme dissociation of air causes low pressure or implosion inside the chamber, which sucks even more air in through the craft's inlet ports. The production and volume of these ions would be proportional to the rotational speed of the chamber. Additionally, the material of the craft itself was made of the aforementioned diamagnetic catalysts and materials, particularly copper and silver. 
high energy collision of air molecules within these or with these diamagnetic surfaces further fractionated these molecules creating a dense cloud of electric charges when these particles contact the ambient air corona discharges will take effect and I submit that perhaps even sonoluminescence due to cavitation of the water in the moist air. Both the corona discharges and the possible sonoluminescence may be the source of the glowing magnetism which was described. The Lorentz force is also involved due to electric current from moving charges and their magnetic fields aiding in the separation of electric charges. This charge separation results in a tremendous electrical gradient with a positive potential at the center of the craft and a negative charge at the periphery. The excess negative charges also function to supercool the chamber, giving rise to the familiar phenomena of superconductivity. Under these conditions, a, strong, a super strong magnetic field is produced from an interdependent cascade effect of the extreme movement of ions, the high speed movement of the highly polarized chamber, and the superconductive state which greatly supplemented the entire system. This superconductive state would also fortify and upgrade the diamagnetic properties of the craft even further, causing the circulating charged ions with their magnetic fields to be powerfully expelled downward from the craft. This would have greatly enhanced the downdraft of the charged particles, resulting in a greatly enhanced suction at the top intakes, strengthening the vacuum and bringing in a continuous cycle of fresh ambient air, which will undergo the same ionizing process. The super strong magnetic field will also have interacted directly and vertically with the geomagnetic field. And finally, the high speed of the ionic air masses generates a gyroscopic effect which has its own gravity modifying and inertia modifying effects as demonstrated by electrical engineer and father of maglev Eric Lathwaite. The gyroscopic effect will also have made the craft highly stable during flight and once surpassing a certain energetic threshold the vortex may have become temporarily self-sustaining similar to a natural whirlpool or tornado enabling the craft to function for a period of time without any further input of energy on behalf of the operators. So as we can see, the entire system is quite complex. But perhaps we can understand some of this mechanics with the following experiment. By, by spinning this entire cylindrical container of water at a very high speed, we can see how the water is flung and pinned to the inner surface of the container by a powerful centrifugal force. Upon slowing, this centrifugal force is converted into an equally powerful centripetal force, producing a massive whirlpool. This happens because of the natural push-pull balances which exist in nature. During spinning, there is a tremendous downdraft, or in the case of water, a tremendous downflow towards the bottom of the container as the whirlpool funnel begins to take shape. The water in the center is moving the fastest and in this case is also being rarefied due to the tremendous centrifugal force pinning the water against the sides of the container. Therefore the center region is at a very low pressure. The atmospheric pressure which is now graded by comparison pushes down in that region, creating a strong, a strong downdraft and downflow as we can see. When the water begins to slow down, the pressure is reestablished and gradually begins to equal the atmospheric pressure once again, creating an equally strong updraft and upflow in the process. So as the spinning of the water filled container slows, an equal and opposite reaction to the initial downflow is generated and like a mechanical spring results in a strong upflow as the lower part of the whirlpool funnel begins to recede, dragging up and granting levity to anything in its weight.
But in the experiment here, we can see that the golf ball levitates by a slightly different process as it is caught up in the centrifugal motion and revolves in the region just around the outer edge of the center of the forming vortex. This is the region in which the downdraft of atmospheric air is generated. Hence the equal and opposite reaction. A downdraft produces an accompanying updraft and vice versa. In effect, it is a similar type of hydrodynamic levitation effect to the weights and jars experiment. A similar action would take place with the atmospheric air within Schauberger's repulsing in which an inner chamber or even the entire frame of the craft itself is spun very rapidly. In this process, the air molecules are being flung violently against the sides of the craft's inner vortex chamber, dissociating the air molecules. In addition to creating a region of lower pressure in the center and above the craft, these molecules collide with each other as well, as, as well as with the metals of the inner chamber, forming ions. These molecules and ions then produce even more ions due to the rubbing friction between them and the high-speed inner chamber, a process known as triboelectricity, or the electricity induced by friction. Like the Whirlpool machine, the, down, the downdraft produced in Schauberger's engine would generate an equal and opposite updraft. The craft would then be caught up in this powerful updraft due to the Coanda effect, an aerodynamic principle in which the dynamic airflow essentially sticks to the, a curved surface. So as the air is drawn up into the updraft, the Coanda effect allows the craft to be sucked up in as well due to the fast speed of the air and the resulting low pressure, resulting in an aero levitation. We can see here that the Coanda effect applies to water as well, as the stream of water follows the curved surface of the spoon. The vortex dynamics and diamagnetism along with the geomagnetic interaction and gyros or gyroscopic reaction will combine to create a truly revolutionary form of lift and propulsion. In summary, the vortex, like acoustic lubrication, is basically another manifestation of rhythmic mechanical energy with both a negative phase, which is the downdraft or downflow, and a positive phase, which is the updraft or upflow. We've also seen that it takes a span of time for the fluid to be entrained into the characteristic shape of a, a vortex, just as it takes a span of time for resonance to maximize vibration in a large cavity. This time, this time span is dependent on the amount of fluid or mass being entrained or resonated, as well as the amount and frequency of input energy. And as the next experiment here demonstrates, because there is a time constant for the vortex creation, it is not necessary that the input energy be continuous. We can also run it intermittently with a start-stop method, adding energy to the vortex in a pulse-like fashion. And as with acoustics, it will have both a specific switching frequency as well as an ideal duty cycle range. Thus the, powerful, the power of the vortex as mechanical energy, rhythmic mechanical energy, can be utilized to overcome both friction and gravity and can even be harnessed to provide propulsion. Now I won't go into the additional mathematical details in the reference article at this time as it is beyond the scope of this particular video which was to explore the line of thought and development from the mechanisms of water vortices and natural diamagnetism to the basics of Schauberger's incredible repulsing craft. But the article is very well thought out and detailed. I may make an additional video in the future using it as a reference if there is any interest. But the link to the article will be placed in the video's description along with a link to my video, The Electromagnetic Hovercraft, in which I give a demonstration on how powerful magnetic fields can indeed interact with the vertical component of the geomagnetic field to generate a vertical force. Obviously, the repulsing concept is long overdue for re-examination. The brilliant Schauberger, known as the Water Wizard, 
and even in some cases as the father of the UFO due to the repulsing sadistic shape, was eventually recruited to work for the U.S. But tragically, like so many before him and since, he was conned by people who did not even remotely have his best interests at heart, and he ended up signing away all of his research as well as any and all of the future developments of implosion technology over to the military industrial complex. Shortly thereafter, he returned to Austria, where he died less than a week later. Like John Keeley and Nikola Tesla, Victor Schauberger left behind an incredible legacy, some of which also, like Keeley and Tesla, is shrouded in mystery and often unfortunately associated with pseudoscience and fringe. His, his insights might also make us wonder what knowledge our ancient ancestors may have accumulated over thousands of years of observation and experimentation which we have yet to rediscover. Did they also discover and utilize these same implosion principles as another formidable tool in their arsenal to overcome gravity and friction in the building of their great monuments? Much knowledge from ancient times has been passed on to the present day, but there's often, often a nagging suspicion that there is much more which may not have survived into the present day in full form, but perhaps is encoded in the myths and legends preserved by past cultures. Do these myths parallel the oral traditions of olden times when knowledge and, inf and information was passed on by storytelling and song rather than writing? There is a fascinating excerpt from author Shirley Andrews' book, Lumeria in Atlantis, Studying the Past to Survive the Future. It describes powerful stones from the center of the earth. And when one of these stones was placed near water, the water was repelled by it. Attaching the stone to the bottom of a boat, the water moved away from it, moving the boat forward. Though this story is a myth, and nevertheless sounds very much like the aforementioned diamagnetism in its repulsion of water, as well as magnetohydrodynamics in its propulsion through water. Both principles arising from the applications of powerful magnetic fields on water. Were these stones and other similar stories nothing but pure fantasy composed in the imaginations of our ancient ancestors? Or are they embellished memories of real events from times past? Though the stones them themselves may not be real, the actual principles that they represent are very real in what we know of diamagnetism and the magnetohydrodynamic effect, which makes this story and those like it all the more intriguing. What if these stories are vague insights into the distant past, distortions of actual course, uh, cultural events, and long lost scientific principles? Do the myths point to something real? Is truth stranger than friction? What about people like Schauberger, Keeley, and Tesla? Are they not only inventors, but also retrievers of aspects of that cultural memory? It is often said that there is really nothing new under the sun. Perhaps we can also say nothing new under the water. Thanks for watching. There's much more to come. And as always, Stay tuned.